Hi, this is Dr. Schmo from the Functional Neurology Center. Today I'm going to be giving you a presentation on visual vertigo. So we're going to start off by going through a slide that talks about body schema. When you break it down, again, your brain wants to know where your head is in space in relation to the rest of your body and where all your body parts are. So where your bicep is, your tricep, your quad, these muscles, they give feedback to your brain. And that feedback has to match with what's going on from your visual system and your vestibular system. So we look at this picture here and the body schema that is basically developed in, in an area of the brain called the parietal insular vestibular cortex. So the visual system combines information with what it gets from your muscles and with what it gets from your vestibular system. All of this information that gets processed by the brain and then you get an output. So you get a motor command that allows you to be able to go reach for something or take a step, slide to the left, slide to the right, uh, turn your head in one direction and have everything make sense for your brain so you don't get dizzy or lightheaded or feel like you're gonna puke and pass out. A lot of patients with visual vertigo have changes in the sensory integration between muscle feedback, visual and vestibular, and they become visually dominant. So their brain gets overwhelmed by complex visual tasks, things moving past them. It could be slow, it could be quick, it could be up or down or left or right, or information that moves in that, uh, towards them in radial directions. So the information that comes into your brain, that has to get processed, and then it also has to be gated. So we're going to talk about that as well. So I'm just gonna break down a paper it's about dizziness and vertigo and how important it is to actually figure out if there's anything else that's going on. So if you have dizziness or if you had an acute vestibular uh, syndrome or symptoms, what is actually provoking it? I mean, is there head trauma? Do you have some sort of vestibular, uh, vestibulopathy? Are you having a stroke? Could there be something metabolic or toxicity or medication, medication withdrawal? So is there something that's actually provoking these symptoms that's giving you an acute vestibular syndrome? Or is there some sort of demyelinating disease or did you have some sort of infection or an encephalopathy? So before we just throw on a diagnosis of, hey, it's visual vertigo or some sort of complex central vestibular dysfunction, when you go and you see your provider, they're going to be thinking in this aspect of, is there something that is um, you know, more severe that's going on? Are you having a stroke? Do you have MS? Do you have some sort of tumor or infection? In episodic vestibular syndrome, you could have an isolated episode of vertigo. So you could have vertigo that develops from hypoglycemia, a vasovagal response, a heart arrhythmia, you could have epilepsy, there could be a, a transient ischemic attack that's occurring. So there are provoking symptoms that can basically um, give you an idea of what type of condition it is. Is it anxiety? Is it vestibular migraine? Do you have Meniere's disease? Um, do you have some sort of cardiovascular condition? All of these things should be ruled out prior to developing some sort of visual or vestibular rehabilitation program. Episodic vestibular symptoms, so provocation, you can have uh, head motion or visual stimulation that provokes your symptoms. And that could be from a central vestibular issue or a peripheral vestibular issue. It could be position-based, so you have to move your head in a certain direction and then it provokes the symptoms you might have BPPV or crystals that got kicked loose in your inner ear, and then you develop some sort of sensation of rotational dizziness. It could be from a head turn. Are there actually changes that are occurring in the vasculature and perfusion to your brain in terms of blood flow? Can it be provoked by hyperventilation? Is there some sort of demyelinization that's occurring in the brainstem and some of these structures that integrate vestibular information? Do you get dizzy or lightheaded or have vestibular symptoms going from seated to standing? You could have orthostatic hypotension or you could have changes in uh, your brainstem from this vagal response 
and you're not getting good perfusion to your head. You could have sound induce, uh, basically stimulation that comes in. You could have superior canal dehiscence, or you could have a fistula in the inner ear. So actually a change um, in these mechanisms of the inner ear where you get basically changes in uh, fluid and how sodium and potassium and calcium and things are mixing. And then that could lead to spontaneous activation or firing of your vestibular nerve and how it goes into the brain. Again, before we just jump on to, hey, it's visual vertigo, let's make sure that we do these provocation tests and make sure that there isn't anything else that is occurring. With chronic vestibular uh, syndrome, there could be a central vestibular issue. And this is a lot of what we see in our office are more chronic vestibular issues. And they've happened from traumatic brain injury or initially you might've had a vestibular migraine or um, you know, some sort of other issue like a labyrinthitis or neuronitis. And then over time, your system didn't compensate appropriately. And now you're developing more like chronic vestibular symptoms. And one of them is uh, PPPD or triple PD that can occur from changes centrally in the brain. And then people start to develop this over uh, compensation with their visual uh, system. They develop a lot of anxiety. Uh, people have a hard time walking through supermarkets, uh, through crowded areas, driving with visual information coming past them. So again, these are all the things that we need to think about prior to throwing a diagnosis of visual vertigo on somebody. With visual vertigo, complex visual environments, passive self-motion, you get illusions of of motion or movement with visual information that's coming in. So basically things like being in a car, bus, train, um, video games, large screens, 3D, virtual environments can sometimes trigger these symptoms and they're very anxiety provoking. They do not feel good. People develop autonomic concomitants. So they get headaches, they feel lightheaded, they feel like they're gonna puke and pass out and they are no fun. So with visual vertigo, we always want to try and figure out what areas of the brain are actually dysfunctional. So there's seven kind of main longitudinal areas that can be um, off that we talk about. So it could be a change that's actually occurring higher in the brain in the cortex. It could be in the thalamus or the basal ganglia. It could be in the cerebellum that it helps integrate a lot of this sensory information between the eyes and the neck and body and gravitational load. There could be changes that are occurring in the brainstem. There can also be changes that are occurring in the spinal cord. You can have issues just end organ with the muscle, with the nerves that are going uh, from the peripheral nerves going back into the spinal cord and then up into the brain. With visual vertigo, you can have decreased activation of muscle feedback into the brain where your proprioceptive system is basically down and your visual system is cranked up and your vestibular system might not be matching with what your other systems are saying. And then you get some sort of visual information, it overwhelms the brain, you get an autonomic response, and then you feel symptomatic. Your eye muscles themselves actually have proprioceptors that provide feedback through V1, the trigeminal distribution, and that's gonna go back into the brain. So your brain wants to know where all of your eye muscles are. They wanna know where your neck muscles are. The deep muscles, the intrinsics, the flexors, the extensors of the neck, your suboccipital muscles, and then the nerve information that comes from those muscles, that goes into the brain and that gets compared with what the extraocular muscle proprioceptors are saying. So your brain wants to know where your eyes are in space, eyes open and eyes closed. And again, that information matches with your neck, with your gastrocnemius, your soleus, your ankle feedback, your glute muscles, that all has to match. And it all kind of goes into the brainstem, into these central vestibular neurons. So they're multi-sensory. And in the brainstem, it's taking in all the information from the vestibular, the eyes, the muscles, that's where it all combines. And that's where a lot of dysfunction occurs with head trauma you develop this torsion, this bio uh, mechanical 
change, a rotation, acceleration, there's torsion, the brainstem gets affected and midline areas get affected in the brain that control ocular motor function, vestibular, and how these systems talk to each other. One of the things I wanna talk about now are there's different streams in the brain of visual information. So the information is going to, basically it's gonna come in, but once it comes in, then it has to feed forward and go through different loops. So it comes in through the retina, it passes back, it goes through the occipital lobe, and from the occipital lobe, then you're gonna go into different streams of information. One of the streams, the dorsal stream, goes through the parietal lobe. And it's all about where, it's all about spatial processing, uh, location, movement, spatial transformation, spatial relations of where your body is in relationship to all your other body parts and where you are in relationship to space. The information that goes more into the temporal is about what is it? What is the, the color of it, the texture of it? the shape, the size of that information coming in. All of that information has to be combined together and fed forward into the frontal lobe to fire down through different motor loops through the basal ganglia and into the, the brainstem, into the midbrain, through these descending pathways to allow you to have reflexogenic responses of moving your body and moving your muscles, knowing what that object is, knowing where it is, knowing what it is to have appropriate response to your environment. Depending on where that object is in your visual field, it can actually activate different streams. So say for example, you're working with a patient and that patient might have an issue with information in their upper field of view compared to their lower field of view. Or you can do rehabilitation or different types of eye exercises or even vestibular exercises where they're looking in different directions and that might be the key to actually getting that person better is doing different feedback in different regions of their visual field to activate pathways that are more ventral or dorsal stream or pathways that are more about um, helping them perceive motion and perceiving real motion versus are you still? Are you still or is the world still? Is the world moving? Are you moving? And knowing where you are in your peripersonal space versus your extrapersonal space, the information out away from you. I mean, this is how complex the, the visual system is. I mean, there's multiple areas of the brain that are involved with visual input. So from a clinical perspective, checking eye movements, checking your visual, um, basically your ability to tolerate visual flow of information coming in, that can pinpoint where in the brain there's dysfunction. And we combine that with looking at all of your other neurological examination findings, palpation of your neck, looking at neck position sense, looking at gait, looking at balance, looking at ocular motor function, vestibular function, we compare all of these different functions to what we see with your quick eye movements, your slow eye movements, your vestibular responses to how you move your head. And we take that into account and try and decide where in the brain there's dysfunction. Is there dysfunction in the cerebellum, in the parietal lobe, in the frontal lobe, in the basal ganglia, in the thalamus? Is it more in the brainstem? What region in the brainstem is dysfunctional? Is it the upper brainstem? Is it more in the pontomedullary region? Do patients have autonomic symptoms? Do they have more issues with light and sound? Maybe there's some sort of change occurring in the upper brainstem. Do people have uh, movement disorders? Do they have tilts of their head? Do they have posturing? Maybe there's a change occurring in the basal ganglia. Do they get dizzy when they have their eyes open versus their eyes closed? Is there a vestibular issue? Is there a visual processing issue? We're talking about function. We examine these different regions of the brain. We do our neurological exam, we do our structural exam, we do our autonomic exam, and we run lab work on people to try and make sure that we're not missing anything that could be huge for getting you better. The visual system, depending on where things are in your visual field, that information is gonna come in, it's gonna hit the retina, it might stay on one side, it might cross and go over to the other side. 
goes through the optic chiasm, hits the lateral geniculate, geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, goes back to the cortex, the visual cortex, there's different regions. And then basically information is gonna feed forward, it's gonna go through different streams. And then the, all regions of the brain are involved with vision. They're talking to each other. They wanna know where you are, they wanna know what the motion is, they wanna know if things are moving in one direction, is there something behind it moving in the other direction? Your brain integrates all of this complex activity, puts it together to allow you to not feel dizzy or have some sort of autonomic symptom. Visual vertigo of ocular motor origin. In the past, people thought that dizziness is basically only related to issues with the inner ear, the vestibular system. When I place patients on virtual reality, we can make them feel like they're rotating and they're spinning and have an extreme vestibular response without even moving their head. With that said, we know that the visual information is activating uh, areas in the brainstem that are involved with vestibular input. You can have feelings of vection or feelings of movement with visual information that comes into your brain. If you have an issue with a gating mechanism or you injured some sort of you know, autonomic pathway that allows you to get blood flow to areas of the brain and now you have changes in perfusion and have spontaneous firing of different regions of the brain, you might get some sort of input and then get a increased activation or overstimulation and then feel visual vertigo with some sort of simple pursuit or maybe you had a saccade and you missed a target and that information is basically overstimulating your brain and leading to a perception of vection or movement or dizziness. The proprioceptive senses from the extraocular muscles, they affect your motor efferents of your body. So the actual information that's coming in from your eye muscles, that can change how you move throughout space. When we see patients with traumatic brain injury, it's common for them to develop changes in near versus far vision. You'll see these ocular muscles actually go into different types of spasm or contraction. People have a hard time with convergence. When you develop changes in convergence, you actually see that bigger muscles like the superior rectus, which does have the ability to intort and adduct, will try and make up for the fact that you cannot converge and then you develop some sort of ocular tilt. And say if you had one eye doing that, but the other eye is fine, your brain um, from one aspect, from one eye might perceive that you're tilted while the other eye perceives that something's normal while your vestibular system perceives that your head is normal and your neck perceives that things are normal. That could be a mismatch between extraocular muscles and that could give you vertigo, uh, could give you a feeling that maybe you're, you're rolling or something moves in front of you and then you get a strong activation of that muscle and it torts and you might feel like you got some sort of torsional information when you were translating, and that can make you feel like you're dizzy or have some sort of vestibular symptom. One of the tests that we'll talk about is VNG and the ability to actually graph your eye movements out with video analysis that's gonna look at gaze stability, pursuits, saccades, optokinetics, which are basically just different types of eye movements that you get in your everyday world. With uh, VNG, we can graph these out, get good data, do therapies, reassess, see if we're making appropriate changes. Patients with visual vertigo, they get worsening of their dizziness with vil, uh, visually challenging environments. Again, so supermarket uh, displays, driving in heavy traffic, um, you might be moving even slow and get some sort of change in visual feedback that might make you feel dizzy compared to moving quick. Everybody's different. It could be a slow movement. It could be a medium speed. It could be fast speed. It could be very, very fast speed. Everybody's got different types of visual information that can overstimulate, overstimulate your brain. And that's why we actually like to you know, do our bedside exam, check things at different speeds, near, far, complex backgrounds, simple backgrounds, standing, seated, lying down. Um, what do you look like flat versus foam with eye movements? What do you look like in virtual reality environments? Sometimes we have to try and pull things out. And we can pull those things out, figure out what they are, and try and make improvements. 
there's something called the visual vertigo analog scale. And basically you just rate your symptoms from zero to 10. I think having outcome measures like this are a good idea because then you can you know, basically track and see how patients are improving or they can track themselves. Uh, visual uh, dependence can be triggered by different types of issues. So you could have vestibular disease that triggers visual dependence. You could have a migraine, psychiatric situations, panic anxiety, overstimulation of regions of the brain, uh, brain trauma can lead to visual dependence and lead to visual vertigo. Uh, we should measure and try and see what happens with patients with optokinetic stimulation. So if you watch my fingers and I move them by and you try and pick up each one, does that give you symptoms left and right versus up and down versus if I'm actually torsioning in front of you, we can do that in virtual reality in 360 degree environment, left, right, up, down, torsion. We can do different environments. I could put you um, out in the forest. I could uh, put you in space and have stars rotate in front of you. I could put you in a tunnel. I can put you in a barony drum and have things rotate around you. So we, we do do these things with people, but we understand that we could potentially make them worse. So we're always very, very careful to make sure that we don't overstimulate people and make people worse. You're gonna to wanna to look at platform posturography and look at flat versus foam, head in different positions, head left, head right, forward, back, um, head tilted, different canal planes to see if we can trigger some sort of uh, vestibular symptom and compare actually eyes open versus eyes closed. A lot of times patients with visual vertigo will get worse with their eyes open when you're checking posturography. Rod and frame test is a test that basically slants a room and then there's a line and then you have to take that line and then find vertical even though the room is slanted. We do that in our office with Virtualis VR. We'll also do the subjective visual vertical test where we'll have Basically, uh, you wanna take a vertical line and get it to be perfectly vertical. In patients that have, you know, they've had stroke or some sort of demyelinating disease or tumor or infection, you'll see large tilts of their subjective visual vertical. They'll develop what's called a pusher syndrome and they might be tilted uh, either same side or opposite, opposite side, depending on what's occurring with their brain. Changes in, these, in your brain's perception of vertical will lead to head tilts, will lead to autolithic-based symptoms where patients might feel like they're floaty, dizzy, rafty. They might feel like they're rocking and rolling on a boat. Very important to assess SVV and rod and frame in patients with visual vertigo. A lot of times, patients with visual vertigo, they're told that it's, it's psychological. Um, many of the tests that are performed, everything's normal. Their vestibular testing is normal. And again, it's how all of these systems integrate together and how your brain perceives where you are in space and how the sensory systems talk to each other. So you might have a perfectly normal vestibular test. Your caloric testing might be perfectly normal. Your eyes might be perfectly normal. Your visual acuity is perfectly normal. You're strong, your muscles are strong, but when you basically combine doing some sort of activity like walking and you have some sort of abnormal feedback from your muscles and then your vestibular system is just slightly off centrally and then your visual system has to make up for something, that could be all that it takes. Just some minor dysfunction occurring in how these systems talk to each other and how they're actually gated by areas of the brain like the cerebellum and how the cerebellum is so important for basically regulating brainstem, autonomics, and central vestibular function. Here's a picture of the, the inner ear, middle ear, and outer ear. So basically with the vestibular system, you got canals and you have your autolithic organs. So you have the canals are gonna respond more to angular acceleration and when you have issues with the canals, you feel like you have rotational vertigo. Your autolithic system has your utricle and your saccule. Utricle and saccule, they're different organs that have um, basically calcium carbonate crystals that are sitting on different membranes that give you the uh, gravitational load. It helps detect up and down. 
whether your head is going left and right, whether you're rolling or moving up and down, heaving. This is a lot of where we see dysfunction in patients where basically their, their peripheral vestibular system is fine. It's how the information is coming in centrally and can your brain decipher translation versus roll versus rotation. And a lot of that occurs through different gating mechanisms in the brain stem. So that information from the ear goes into the brain and then that's gonna go up into the cortex and then it's all gonna to talk to each other in the parietal insular vestibular regions to let you know where your body is in space. So the VOR is basically, if I move my head one way, do my eyes come back equal and opposite to how I move my head? Is there a perfect gain of one? There's different types of rehabilitation strategies that can be used. So a lot of the patients that we see have been doing basically no, no, and yes, yes, rehabilitation. But we think that you need to do rehabilitation and basically head heave, different types of roll mechanisms, give different body feedback exercises, load the body with weight while you're doing different translational exercises to kind of target those regions that sometimes are just missed with typical uh, basically vestibular rehabilitation. It's also very important to have the neck giving good feedback to the brain. So we do a lot of cervical proprioceptive retraining exercises with VOR exercises. And we like to start passive. So if somebody goes and they move their head and their, their eyes are just slipping, why would we have them go and move their head and just miss the target the whole time and basically plasticize the system to do it wrong? So a lot of the rehab that we do is actually passive to start. We like to start on our back, move people up to seated, then standing, then walking, then moving. And then we need to activate the lower extremity. We need to activate the legs to get good feedback into the cerebellum. And then we just start layering more complexity on their exercises. It might be important to just do a, an exercise in one direction versus doing it bilateral. If there's some sort of change in more unilateral and how that information comes in. What does this mean for a patient? checking these things, being specific with it, the repetitions, the frequency, whether you do it lying down, seated, standing, walking, moving, body weight, no body weight, in VR, out of VR, with eye exercises, without eye exercises, with a complex background, without a complex background, it all matters to actually get your system better. Here's a picture of me with one of my patients, Jayton, and I'm going in there and I'm just basically doing VOR, how Maggie testing, basically head thrust to see if his eyes are coming back equal and opposite. One of the technologies that we use in our clinic, it's, it's called the gyrostim chair. It's about sensory motor integration. There's different things that you can do with it. We always start very simple, just oscillating people left and right, forward and backwards, we're doing different types of combinations of head and eye exercises to help improve spinal tone and feedback from the neck. We do that in addition to our chiropractic adjustments that we do that are specific based off of your exam. And then we can do different things where we add uh, basically laser targeting as we rotate you. You can hit targets and that can help you get a better idea of your peripersonal versus extrapersonal space whether you're moving or the background's moving, it can help you deal with um, basically habituation of optokinetic stimulation. And sometimes it's good to do that, sometimes it's not good to do that. Some people we just like to motion where they're not using the laser and they're just keeping their eyes steady on a target and we might rotate them compared to rotating them while they're doing some sort of complex cognitive task. And I think it's very important to assess the cervical spine and make sure there's no contraindications to putting people through the chair. Do they have a Chiari malformation? Do they have a plugged up carotid artery? Do um, they have DJD and degenerative disc disease and they're getting abnormal feedback from their neck and if you would rotate them and have them do some sort of complex activity, you could lead to you know, more whiplash or uh, causing symptoms. So. We take what we do in here very seriously to make sure that we're doing the right things for you. And with it, we've seen that you can improve uh, VOR rehabilitation strategies and get people's eyes and head to line up. 
and it can help with visual vertigo and it can help with dizziness and balance dysfunction. Again, the brain is gonna take in information from the ear. That's gonna go into the brain stem. This is a depiction of the vestibular nuclei. These pathways actually, they go up to the eyes, but they also go down to your spine, to your pelvic floor muscles, to your legs, to allow you to be able to have good reflexogenic movement of your body if somebody came up to try and knock you and, and push you over. So having the connections between the legs and the neck and the eyes all saying the same thing is important to prevent you from falling. The information from the vestibular nuclei is going to coordinate the neck and limb motion, and it's also going to be integrated and um, basically it's going to take in information from the cerebellum. There's different nuclei in the cerebellum. Depending on what we see with our exam, we can basically decide is there more of a issue with the vestigial nucleus or the flocular nodular lobe or the dorsal vermal region, actually depending on what's going on with your eyes. So, Say if you had downbeating nystagmus, might, you might have an issue with a flocular nodular lobe. If you were stopping short, there might be an issue with the vermis. If you're going too far, there might be an issue with the uh, vestigial nucleus. Not very important for patients, but for providers, it's very important to actually figure out what where areas of the brain are dysfunctional, what areas of the cerebellum are dysfunctional, doing some sort of therapy that makes sense, and then going back and then rechecking your findings to see if, hey, did their dysmetria improve? Um, do they have improvements in their DDK or finger tapping or dual tasking or their gait with doing rehabilitation? There's a lot of complexity that's going on in the vestibular nuclei. These pathways are basically bilateral. They're talking to each other. So a lot of times with central vestibular dysfunction and traumatic brain injury, you're gonna have issues on both sides. But sometimes there might be more of a horizontal issue on one side, but an issue with translation over on the other side, just due to how these pathways are very connected with each other, something called the vestibular commissure that connects these two pathways. So I think it's very important to also realize that there's a lot of sensory convergence that happens in the vestibular nuclei. So, you know, you could actually help somebody with visual vertigo by doing some sort of complex movement of their body or their leg or maybe stimulating their tongue could give feedback to their brain. An eye exercise could help a vestibular issue. A body exercise could help a visual issue. Um, sound could help a visual issue. Sound could help a vestibular issue. Multi-sensory integration. And sometimes you need to go in there and get creative and start layering different types of sensory stimulus to see if you can make some sort of improvement in your person. This is just a picture of uh, basically the utricle and the autolithic organs that I was talking about that have hair cells and calcium carbonate crystals sitting on membranes and how they basically go into the brain. And they let you know where you are in space in terms of where your head is. Again, we want to have different types of postural challenge, challenges, environmental challenges, Duration, direction, amplitude, velocity, all of these things matter when you're doing a vestibular ocular rehabilitation with your patient. And again, why am I talking about this with visual vertigo? If your VOR is down, your visual system might be enhanced. If your visual system's enhanced and your, uh, say if your VOR is decreased, you might actually see potentially an increase in the gain of your neck. And you go and you move your neck and then too much feedback from your neck that might not match with what's going on with your visual system and you might get very very dizzy with some sort of visual information another thing that i wanted to point out is it's very very important to assess autonomic function in your patients all these areas of the brain that i'm talking about they need blood flow they need blood flow they need oxygenation they need perfusion for these pathways to fire to be able to be steady to be stable to not over facilitate or be over firing. If you had over firing in a pathway, the spontaneous activity, you might be very close to threshold. You get some sort of movement. You feel you're like you're about to puke and pass out. What do we check for autonomic function and what are autonomics? They're the, the basics of survival for your brain. The autonomic system is about getting blood flow to all the organs and all regions of the brain that need it. If you have an issue, you might have, um, 
dizziness, I'm going to seat it to standing. You might basically cover one eye, see uh, darker on one side, might see lighter on the other. It's called the red desaturation test, and we'll talk about that in our at-home assessment. You might see changes in the palate when you open your mouth and you go, ah, you might actually see changes in how the palate elevates, which is uh, innervated by the vagus nerve. People might have issues with bowel sounds. Their gut might not be propulsing and moving. They might have cold hands and cold feet. You do a capillary refill and you go like this, and basically um, you'll see a delay in how the blood actually gets perfused back into your fingertips. Patients might have issues with their actual just biomechanics of their ribs and their scapula, their, their neck, their shoulders, their clavicle, and how they're actually getting these biomechanical motions to allow them to be able to get good oxygenation. Pupils, pupils are very important. Do they have big pupils? Do they have small pupils? There's a app, it's called Reflex. Uh, Dr. Carrick will talk about it and we'll uh, put some more information out there about the Reflex app. And now we can actually look at the time to summation, intensity of summation, and time to fatigue of these pupillary responses and actually graph it out for you. You do some sort of test and then get this information. Um, the vestibular system is very integrated and tied with your autonomic system. Why do you feel like nauseous or dizzy if you're going on a roller coaster, for example? And dual tasking. What happens to people when they have to think and do two things at once? Does that does that mess with them? Do they feel like they're going to fall over? Are they listening to one side when they think? And maybe that can tell us that your brain can't divert blood to the you know, regions that it has to when you're trying to think and dual task. Therapies, well, it depends. Obviously, it's very important to get blood flow to your brain. There's different therapies that we do in the office to ensure that we're getting uh, good oxygenation. Here's a couple examples. So. Heart rate increase and your blood pressure drops when you're going from seated to standing. This could be positional orthostat orthostatic tachycardia or hypovolemia. And the therapy might be drive the legs, salt intake, get more fluids. We like to use Normatec compression boots, electrical stimulation on the legs and abdomen, and always run labs and look for metabolic dysfunction, see if there's you know, some sort of infection, is there small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, anything else that we might see heart rate and blood pressure decrease, maybe your sympathetic system is uh, failing. There's different things that you can do to activate the sympathetics, which we'll actually talk about. A lot of times with a sympathetic system failure, there's chronic metabolic dysfunction we see in our patients. So it's very important to run labs as well. Heart rate increase and blood pressure rise, uh, parasympathetic system failure. We know that vestibular rehabilitation can drive your parasympathetic system. So doing vestibular rehab, tilt table therapy, vagal stimulation, trigeminal stimulation, can activate the brain stem, activate your parasympathetic system and potentially make symptoms to get, um, make improvements to your symptoms of visual vertigo because you're getting better perfusion into you know, the cerebellum, the occipital lobe, the vestibular nuclei when you're trying to do rehabilitation. So these are our top five neural circuits that we think you need to examine. It's the frontal lobe, uh, the temporal parietal lobe, the cerebellum, the brainstem, the vestibular system. With the frontal lobe, you wanna look at quick eye movements, gaze stability, look at gait, and look at finger tapping. And what are kind of symptoms that you could get? Brain fog, distraction, issues with focus, motivation, movement speed might be slow. Your temporal parietal lobe, so, Issues with pursuit eye movements, people might feel spaced out. Issues with memory, language comprehension. You could have issues with the cerebellum and the midline, so you could have changes in ocular motor function. You might see issues with balance, tremors, issues with coordination, and even connecting thoughts can be an issue as well. Changes in the brain stem, it can be upper or lower. You can have cranial nerve dysfunction, issues with autonomics. Issues with the connections between the vestibular system and the neck. There's all of these complex reflexes between the neck and the eyes and the vestibular system, and you can have issues peripheral or central. With visual vertigo, it's important to actually assess all of this stuff because the visual system involves the whole brain. Your visual vertigo could be coming from changes in your psychotic eye movements. Your visual vertigo could be coming from changes in the parietal temporal regions of the brain in areas called MT and MST. 
There could be areas in V6 with real motion cells and how your brain detects motion versus something moving in the background. The cerebellum could be an issue with visual vertigo and basically how your cerebellum gates the vestibular nuclei and your uh, uh, central vestibular system and how that might not match with your ocular motor system. Autonomics can be very important because we we're talking about good blood flow and perfusion. And then obviously the vestibular system and the connections between the head and the neck and the eyes are very important. Accurate uh, vision, spatial sensation is a complex activity through these binocular ocular motor uh, inputs and how the information goes through the retina and how these signals are basically fused and how you're getting good feedback from your eye muscles themselves and how you basically combine this information. Different techniques that we like to use if people have these different spasms. So we like to sometimes just do tapping on the trigeminal system, palming. Uh, we like to do V1 stimulation. We like to do basically barbecue rolls where people close their eyes and do different movement with their vestibular system really slow, eyes closed. And then sometime even do different exercises, eyes closed with the eyes to try and move their eyes out of kind of basically this, this spasm that they're getting in these ocular motor muscles. Here's a picture of the trigeminal system. Like I said, these extraocular muscles, they get proprioceptive feedback that goes through V1 into the brain. So your brain knows where your head is in space in relationship to where your eyes are. And this just goes through basically uh, the, the nuclei, the longest nuclei in the brainstem. Uh, it has a mesencephalic component, a sensory and a spinal nucleus. It's very important for headaches. It's important for uh, autonomic function. By stimulating it, we can activate different regions of the brainstem non-invasively that can help with visual vertigo and, and eye movements. Another area of the brain I'll just talk about quickly is the superior colliculus. It's an area in the upper brainstem that can become dysfunctional. They have, it has basically a retinotopic map or a grid of where, your, where objects are in relation to you. There's different layers of it. It's a very complex system. You can get startle responses from peripheral information that's coming in. The frontal lobe talks to the superior colliculus, the cerebellum does, um, the basal ganglia does. There's these connections between the superior colliculus and different uh, neurons in the brainstem. And when there's dysfunction there, you can develop different types of jerkiness or intrusions on your eye movements. And then that can give you an abnormal ocular motor feedback. And that might not match with what your visual system, uh, maybe your peripheral ambient system compared to your retinal system a more focused image. Um, there can be a mismatch in those systems. And then a mismatch can occur and you start to develop some sort of posturing in your neck and now the neck isn't giving the right information into the cerebellum and into the superior colliculus. And then you develop tightness in the neck, changes in your retinotopic maps, changes in posturing of the body, changes in the connections of the cerebellum and how they talk with the brainstem. And there you go, you get some sort of visual slipping, your brain doesn't like that. And then you don't know where you are in space and you develop some sort of uh, vertigo or sensation of vection or movement with a visual input. So that's basically the, the basics of visual vertigo. I know I went into some pretty kind of complex stuff, but I think it's very, very important to understand how these sensory systems integrate. And then there's actually things that you can do about it. And we need to have diagnostics. We need to do testing. We need to do therapies. We need to reassess. We need to get objectives. And then we need to track people. And in this Technologies and TBI Summit, we're, we're basically, we're going through everything. We're giving you all the information. We're giving you things, ideas that you can do at home. I'll even give you a list of some simple things that might be helpful at home. We're giving you a at-home telehealth assessment that you can do. You can send us the information. We can take a look at it. We're offering consultations for people that might need help. So... I think that kind of gives you kind of like the rundown of a visual vertigo. When I said introduction, I meant introduction to, I'm just going to throw all this stuff at you and we're going to take it from there. We have some amazing speakers. We have Dr. Ted Carrick. We have Frank Osibon. Uh, we have Sherrick Peck. We have Brett Jarosz. We have Nick Stoholm. We have Dr. Sass. We have Dr. Shem. 
Um, I'm doing presentations on there as well, obviously. And all of us are, are doing this to basically get this information to people and help you get better. And most importantly, help you get better faster.